Yeah, this song has a special memory for me. I mean, you can see it's from a Christian heavy metal band in the late 80s or mid 80s, I guess, Messiah Prophet. And I love this cover. I mean, I'm assuming that's Jesus hammering out an electric guitar. You know, I just think it looks so cool. But anyways, because uh, when I was in I first heard this when I was in high school, and this is in the late 80s. And my friend, you know, good friend, my best friend was an atheist. And he all had all the big 80s hair and stuff like that. He was really big into heavy metal, like Ozzy Osbourne and Judas Priest and Iron Maiden. And, but the thing was that they always, a lot of times, especially I think with like Black Sabbath and Ozzy Osbourne, they would make references to the Bible, you know, like the book of Revelation or stuff about the devil or the beast. And, stuff. and he didn't, he was an atheist, so he didn't know what they meant. But he knew I read the Bible. <laughs> so he would always come to me and ask me like what some of these occult references and the lyrics would mean. And I'd try to explain it for him and stuff like that. And eventually his sister gave him this cassette tape of Christian rock music. I, I was like, you know, very prim and proper person. I'm like, Christians can't play heavy metal and stuff like that. But I listened to it. I would listen to it as I was going to bed. I would put it in, you know, old school cassette tape. And I was and I always remembered it. I mean, I, I always remembered the name, and I didn't buy it, but eventually I did when I was in the seminary. <laughs> I was thinking about the old days. And I'm like, you know, yeah, I, wanna, I should go back and listen to some Christian rock, see what I was missing, you know? This was like one of the first things I bought, a CD of Messiah Prophet. I always remembered the name, could always remember the song. Dylan Chase, my lord, my king, he's the master of the metal. Couldn't remember much else. But anyways, so uh, yeah, that's song, one of my favorite songs. Jesus, Master of the Metal by Messiah Prophet. Get used to it. You'll hear more of it, as you know, Mr. Marita. You'll get it from both ends, Mr. Marita. You know? <laughs> I'll, I'll try to switch it up and change it up for you so you hear different bands. Not always the same. So, so good to see you all. And this is our first class where I'm going to give you... Yes. Hello. Hello. I'm Gina. Oh, Miss Jacoby. Yes. Hello, Miss Jacoby. And Mr. Case, and I've got you. Okay. All right. So I'm talking about what is writing. So I'm going to go through the basically the title of the course is take it logically. It's encountering sacred writings. So about what is writing to begin with. What does it mean for something to be sacred? Okay, but, and that's. In fact, I was listening to one of the readings, uh, the uh, article on sacredness, sacred and profane from the Encyclopedia of Religion. I know it's a little longish. I'm sorry for that. But just do with it what you can. You know, it gets sometimes a little, gets a little bit into the weeds technically, but just do try to understand as much as you can from it. Um, we talk about the sacred. And then the rest of the course is basically the encounter aspect. How do we encounter the writings, any writings, not even just religious writings, but any book or writing that you're, you're reading? Um, it's got an author. It's a cr got a creator, an originator. Um, and but once the author finishes his work or her work and it sends it out for publishing, it can take on a life of its own, and people can see stuff they don't, you know, that's that's not there. And I think this is with any that might not be there, but they can read into it the intentions of the author. Um, make all sorts of connections that maybe the author hadn't thought of. But I think this happens in the arts world in general. Like if you're watching a television show or a movie, same kind of thing. You know, they, they film it and it's out there and the director might have an idea. Then you've got the writer of the script who has an idea of what they want it to be. But then it hits the audience and the audience might see something that's like, huh, never even made that connection. Never, never occurred to me. And the same thing can happen, I think, with the Bible. Bible as a writer. So what is writing? To begin with. Okay. Well, here's a definition. Somewhat lengthy definition. I apologize. I try to keep them short and pithy, but it's complicated. I mean, you, you take for granted things that, you know, um, you, you know, but if someone ever asks you to define it, it's like you got a brain freeze, you know? You know what time is. You know what, if I tell you, you know, you should be to the class on time, or this is the time for the class. Oh, whoops, I wasn't, that wasn't, I didn't, no, was that, there was nothing, sorry. I'm stepping in. Mr. Marita, I'm putting my foot in my mouth all day today. Anyways. Um, but uh, if I asked you, define time for me. Try to explain it to me. What's the concept? It's a concept. It's not a thing. 
Oh, you're gonna do that? Oh, but <laughs> schedule, I guess. Stop learning. Stop trying to learn. Go to university. You're having fun. <laughs> so yeah, what what the what do you think? It's a schedule from like daytime, like sunlight to sundown. Okay. Um good. That's good. What if there's no sun? I don't I couldn't tell you because I don't know. There's never been a way to know the sun. Really? As mm -hmm. Well let me take you back, sir. I've got a story to tell you. <laughs> About 13.8 billion years ago. Yeah, and I don't know. <laughs> no, that's okay. Socrates said the beginning of what? Socrates is a great philosopher, Greek philosopher. Um, he's not the only one, there are other philosophers. He said the beginning of knowledge was in the beginning to know that you don't know, how much you really don't know. And that's fine. Yeah, it might come down to something you really don't know. Yeah. I don't know how you can tell if it's just dark, all dark. Well, I think you did what you did was a rational thing. You know, like how do we tell time here? And basically, we're telling time by the sun a lot of the time. Yeah, you're telling by the, the time, by the sun, by the Earth's um, uh, revolution around the sun, our star. Okay, which is logical. Um, but then you have to, you know, what about before time? You know, like the first instances of the Big Bang or something, when there were no galaxies, had formed, no stars had formed yet. Um, no people even yeah. to look at this, you know, the sun or the moon to judge time. So what? It, so that takes us a little deeper, I think. Like what, from more of a materialistic view of, okay, I can look at the moon, the shape, the, the phases of the moon, or I can look at where the sun is in the sky. And now we're like, okay, but wait, what if I'm out in the middle of the, the galaxy, not the galaxy, but the universe somewhere where I can't see any stars or anything, just dark void? How do you tell time then? What's time there? Nothing. Nothing? It's just nothing. So time stops existing. You don't think it's real? It's a construct. Okay, good. Interesting. Why do you think that? It would all be present in a sense. You have no sense of the past or the future. That's interesting. It's serious. By the Freemasons. I said no, I said a bit. Yeah, it's a bit. You think so? Why? Why do you think someone would want to do um, time? I think, or no, not time itself, just the idea that it's. Okay. Challenges like everything. And I guess you could say conspiracy in the sense that it's a group of people agreeing on to do something, to accept something. Conspiracy doesn't necessarily have to be negative. It's just you know, two or more people deciding to do something. Usually it's a wrong thing. That's good, encountering secret writings. That's something that secret writings might do. Maybe, for sure. They make sense. They make sense to the world. Did anyone else have? I thought there were other hands, and I don't want to dominate my, myself. I also have any ideas. Time. I think time has a beginning. I think this is to say that time began with the creation of the universe, the extension of, of matter. So I think there seems to be some kind of connection between matter and time. You know, before that, there's, there's nothing. There's a void. Yeah, it was before like, it was like the matter reached like here. Like, there was matter before that, so like time really never existed or existed really. Or it came into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just was always there. Interesting. 
Okay. So see, think about these things. When we know them intuitively, yes, when we use the word, the concept, and, and it, it affects your actions because you knew to show up, right? Yeah, it's like the schedule. Yeah, but how did you, if you didn't think through what time is, Mr. Plain, how did you know to show up to class? <laughs> I mean, you may have. I mean, I'm not saying you didn't, but huh. so you knew what time was. You knew what time was. Interesting. But God, isn't that sometimes how people argue against God? They say, "Well, you, know, you don't know what a God is. You can't see a God. You can't fully understand a God." The concept, you know, it's a word that we use. Sorry, I've been preaching. All right. <laughs> Anyways, um, but okay. My point. Why? Uh, my point is um, the same thing happens with, say, writing. Okay, you're writing. Apparent, you're writing. Okay, um, you know what writing is. But what is writing? And linguists debate over this. You know, people who and kids think about it. Maybe they think about it too much. <laughs> um, but. This is what I could come up with when I looked stuff up. And writing. What is writing? It is an action. It's an action. It's, the, it's a word, really. It's a word um, for an action of forming or producing by means of a tool or an instrument. I could just say tool. Visible symbolic characters on a thing's surface for the purpose of expressing abstract conceptual meaning. Okay, it's, it's a long definition, it's a big definition, um, but now I'll, I'll break it apart, we can talk about it a little bit. Um, so it is an action that's done, okay? So there's a physicality to writing, okay? It's not, uh, whoops, it's not, uh, you know, airy-fairy just up in the atmosphere. It's, it's something that we do. And you're, you produce something with this action. You create, it's creative. Uh, and you have to use a tool to do it. Okay, so that's what kind of like why writing is unique to human beings because we see, I know other animals, you might have seen nature shows where you got the monkey who takes the, you know, the piece of wood and, you know, sticks it into the ant hill and gets some ants in the, okay. Um, now you could say that's a tool and it's tool like activity, but we're doing it on another level. <laughs> We're making tools to make tools, you know, stuff like that. Um, and writing is a tool. It's something, it's part of that tool aspect of our humanity. Um, that, you know, I can, you know, you could say I'm writing words in the air, like W or A. And, you know, you can see that I'm right, but it's not really writing. We're, it's more analogous to writing. Okay, yes. With that definition, we got like comic books without the words. You know how they like had pictures and they mean things. We put that in writing. No, I would say that those are pictures, and and we find out as we we'll find out later that um, proto writing, the first attempts at human writing, come out of pictures. Ultimately, that's what human beings start really doing. The first ways that human beings use to express themselves are through drawings and pictures of things. But they're not writing yet. What, what's the difference? I'll talk about that in a few moments. But what's the difference between, say, picture making and writing? Did you have a question? Yeah, like hieroglyphs, right? Yes, that's very good. But it is also a form of writing, but it's based on pictures. Yeah. It's more directly based on pictures. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, hieroglyphs, like in Egypt. Yeah. They developed in Egypt. Yeah. So, anyways, um, so you need a tool or something, some means of, of using this as a form of communication, and the characters that you use, whether it is, you said, with Mr. Kaysen said, with hieroglyphs, they're mainly pictures, but in others, uh, other languages, sort of alphabets that will develop and stuff like that, letters. Um, these are characters that are symbolic of something else, whether a picture is symbolic of a word, it could also be symbolic of a sound as it becomes, in, for example, languages like Chinese. Um, letters are also symbols. I mean, why, oops. you have the sound, you have the sound, <laughs> all right? But in English, we have different symbols to represent it. You can represent it sometimes by that one, you can represent it sometimes by that one. And you can represent it sometimes by that one, depending on what the word is. In other languages, you just have one symbol, but these are all symbols. I mean, there's no 
in, uh, there's no necessary connection between either of these characters, any of these characters, to the actual sound I'm making near the back of my throat. <laughs> that we would say is a K sound. You could also say it's a C sound or a Q sound if you want. Quiet, cheap, cat. You know? <laughs> Anyways, um, so characters, and it's essential also that these characters be put on a surface. That's what makes it writing. Okay, before, you know, you can say analogously that I'm writing in the air, okay, I'm writing W or whatever. That's not really writing, because once, once I take my hand away, there's nothing there in the air. The air is just fluid that we're in, um, ether. And uh, there's nothing there. The writing has a permanence to it. It has a physicality to it that we don't want to ignore. So it's on a thin surface. The thing could be anything. It could be a stone wall, a piece of paper, you know, a person's body, like with a tattoo or something. Um, and what's the purpose of the writing? The purpose is to express concepts. That's where we get a difference with, say, a comic book that has no, well, we would say no words in it, but that kind of was the fun kind of like already deciding the question before. You know, but if you just have a, a picture book or a comic book or a graphic novel, which to me is just a comic book for adults. <laughs> you know, I don't see the difference, you know, it's a picture of all words. Anyways. Um, but anyways, uh, that's different from a picture, because a picture, you're not really representing a concept. You're not trying to communicate a concept. You can't, you know, with, unless the, the, the artist tells you what this is supposed to mean, but you don't, you know, with words you already know, well, you kind of know what it means. You know, I see a cat that tells you information. But if I just draw a picture of a cat, it's a picture of what looks to be a cat. What, what's, what's my motivation for it? What's, what's my message? That I see one? That you're seeing one? That the cat, I don't know, what, what's the, that there's just a cat there, you know? Cat's fat, the cat's skinny, whatever, you know? What does that mean? What's the message? That's why people in the art world, you know, you see a painting and they can all, people can all disagree on what it means and what, what, is it, what is it trying to say, trying to say. It's not really, we don't even talk about writing, we talk about speech when we talk about pictures. It's more of speaking. Um, so you're trying to express conceptual meaning, a concept. I can draw a picture and tell you it's a picture of time. But before I told you that, how would you know? How it makes you feel. Okay. But if you tell me, Mr. Kazin, well, that picture that you drew... You know, so messy. Okay. But if I tell you, but you tell me that that looks to you like time, it makes you feel like time or something, I say, well, no, I, I actually, you know, uh, it's a dog. <laughs> I meant it to be a dog, you know? But that's what you get with little kids, you know? They show you a little picture, oh, that's beautiful, and then, what is it? <laughs> you know? But if they write their name on it, then you know, oh, that's by Bobby. Spelled with one B, but Bobby's only three, so we'll cut Bobby some slack. Give him an A for effort. <laughs> Anyways, so writing. The word to write in English comes from Old English, Gritan, which is when Rick means to draw. And you'll find a lot of, a lot of I would say a lot of, I don't want to overstate my case, but in a number of languages, the basic meaning that they had that comes to mean write in their language today goes back to words like drawing or painting and stuff like that. So even though we don't remember our ancestors, like the, the memory from our ancestors is there in our words, you know, riton, to, to draw something, um, which comes from Proto-Germanic. Proto just means first. For, so the Germanic languages, as they were emerging as clearly Germanic languages, um, had the meaning of tearing or scratching. So again, you can get that idea that you sometimes get also in other languages of like etching something or carving, as if you would carve something on a wall, like etching a picture or something. Right. And in fact, the, the earliest the earliest source for our language, English, but also German languages and other languages in our language family 
called the Indo-European language family because there are a group of related languages that span from northern India through Iran all the way across Western Europe. Okay, so Indo, I actually should go this way, shouldn't I? So Indo, India, European, and they're all related ultimately to a source language, which is called Proto-Indo-European, the first form. And the word that ultimately the words for writing uh, come from, that are they're based on art, is to carve carving something so again that physicality materiality of of, of uh, you know you're carving the words into something clay or stone or you're etching them as well okay one of the classic definitions of writing although he didn't really intend it to be he was talking about something else comes from this gentleman named aristotle who is an ancient greek philosopher um you can see his dates there, 384 to 322 BC is when he lived. So the fourth century BC. A little bit of coffee. Well, Mr. O'Neill, mostly coffee. <laughs> yes. You heard that joke already. <laughs> anyway. BC, I guess, uh, Mr. Maria, again, you also heard this, but, you know, I'm going to go over it again anyways, just quickly, because we're not always aware of it. Um, BC and AD are dating system, okay? Um, why is it BC and AD? You might see some different dating systems in your textbooks, but in this course, I do BC and AD. What does that mean? This is the key thing. I got you. Before Christ, um, after something uh, after something there's another one but you say bc means before christ one second is it after diocese after diocese is it <laughs> no, but we'll get there, sir. You're on the right track. BC, before Christ. I, I would agree with that one. After death. But, uh, Ms. Renrick, what did you want to say? I got you. What did you want to say? After death. after death as well. And it was, uh, not Ms. Uh, Ms. Bel uh, Belton? Bolton? Bolton? Oh, yeah, Bolton. Bolton. Oh, I thought you raised your hand. Uh, <laughs> Oh, it was you, Ms. Uh, Jacob. Okay. Yes, I was going to say after death. After death, so A.D. Okay. Well, I just, I gave you before Christ. B.C. is correct. Okay, but A.D. is the one where people kind of, we go off the rails because um, we get thrown a curveball in English. Yes, before Christ is an abbreviation based on the English word, on uh, English word. So it's before the time of Christ or Jesus of Nazareth. Okay. Um, but AD does not. AD is based on um, Latin, so it does not mean after death. Because if you think about it, how could Jesus die after he died, or die before he died? I mean, how could Jesus be born or be living the year three after his death? He's alive. <laughs> he's like maybe, you know, he's like a little child, and he's not dead yet, not, not, not for a few more decades. So, I, but I understand where people get that from. Um, and it gets passed on, it's a little tradition that gets passed on from person to person. But no, it comes from Latin. It's a Latin abbreviation from the words Anno Domini. Anno Domini. Which means in English, in the year of the Lord. In the year of the Lord. Okay. Um, those of you who speak, uh, Latin-based languages will be, you know, kind of notice or be familiar with some of these words in Latin. You see Spanish, because Latin, you know, gave birth to a number of different languages in the modern world. Italian, of course, comes from, from Latin itself most directly, because Latin was the language of the Romans, or in Italy. Um, but the Romans had an empire. They spread their language to Spain, so you have Spanish, you have France, into Gaul, we call France, so it's French. Romania, the country of Romania, speaks a Latin based language, fascinating language, it kept some of the more uh, interesting features of Latin, whereas the other languages did not. 
Um, what else? We got Portuguese. And I'm, I'm missing another Oh, that's French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, Romanian. And there are minor languages as well that don't, I'm not minor in the sense that they're unimportant, but they have less speakers like Catalan and Occitan and Sardinian. And they're all based ultimately on classical Latin. Um, and so you might notice, for example, Anno, Anno, year. So you might notice the, the pair of the words in Spanish that they're almost the same. Exactly the same in Italian. Anno means year. Or on, um, if we took French in high school. Okay. Um, domini might, might be a little bit harder because it comes from a word dominus, which we don't really have in English. It means border, master. Um, the closest I can come to, it's not the best example, is a, a mafia don. You know, they call someone a don. Um, another example I could give is a little bit inside baseball, with like sometimes monks are called. Dom's John, you know, they put Dom, which comes from Dom, Dominus, Lord, Master, in front of their names, kind of like we call his father. So Dom, John the Abbot, or something, or Dom Michael. Um, but anyways, uh, it comes from Dominus, or Don, like a mafia Don, is a shortened form of Dominus, which means Lord. Uh, and so the words change in Latin. If anyone took Latin in school, I don't know if they did. But, you know, uh, English used to have a lot of changes in Old English, but not so much anymore. We lost our case system, but Latin has a lot of cases which tell you what the word does in the sentence. So, in this case, anno, anus, really, changes to anno to mean in the year, according to that case, to indicate to you that it's in something. Um, and then domini is the possessive, so it's the, Lord, the Lord's year. So you do kind of have a little relic of that case system when we say lords instead of the year of the lord. Um, so domini, so it changes from dominus to domini. And so we, that's what we took into English as AD. Okay, so that's what it means. You will not always see this in your textbooks um, because people don't some people don't necessarily want to be reminded that our Western calendar is based on the life of a religious figure, Jesus of Nazareth. And that's just the way it is. You know? I can't change it, you know, I always have to reinvent the whole calendar, which sometimes people try to do, but it never work out. But, you know, this is the way it is in our, in our Western culture. If we were in a, another culture, like an Islamic country, out in the Middle East, they don't use this dating system. They date according to an event in the life of their, their religious founder, Muhammad. Um, and then uh, and their date is very different. I think it's, this year is now like 1440. According to their calendar, they don't date it according to the year, but it's according to the life of Jesus. Um, and the same thing in other cultures as well. Other cultures, like if you go into a Jewish synagogue, they date the, their calendar in the synagogue according to the creation of the, of the world, which they think is like 5,000 years old. So it's like 5,000 something something since the creation. So uh, dating systems can be different, but in the West, we date it by, by Jesus of Nazareth. There are people who do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah of Christ, so they object to before Christ. There are other people that don't believe Jesus is the Lord either, um, so they object to saying it's the year of the Lord, so they don't want to do either of those. Well, what do you do? You cover it. <laughs> you use the same calendar, but you just cover it up. And so you'll see in your textbooks that they will say BCE, beyond, and AD, they won't use it all, but all C. They'll say it's the common era, for the common era, and that in the common era. Now, what changed when Jesus of Nazareth was born to change it from the common era, before the common era, to the common era? I don't know. Nothing. It's an historical, speaking of constructs, it's a historical convention that we've kind of come up with so people aren't offended by, even though we're still dating it by Jesus, they don't have to have it pushed in their face that they're dating it by Jesus. Um, if you ask your history professors to teach history, they will back me up. There's no such thing as a common era. They don't, historians don't refer to it. There's nothing about, they, they call it different periods of time, you know, Second Temple period, they divide stuff up into all sorts of different times. You know, history of the Church, the Apostolic period, you know, the post apostolic period, but there's no common era. But that's what you will see BCE and CE. But I'm going to use BC and AD, so you should know what those mean. So, our friend was from the B.C., from four, around 400-some years 
almost b before Jesus Christ. And he was a famous Greek philosopher, and he was writing, he wrote a, a bunch of books or writings about, I think he was mainly talking about logic and how to make logical arguments. And in the context of that, he wrote a book on interpretation, De Interpretatione, okay, on inter which simply translates as on interpretation in, in English. The scholars think he might have written this around 350 BC, in case you're, you're interested. And this is a quote that he gives about writing. Would anyone like to read this from his, his work, De Interpretatione, Aristotle? Would like to read this brief quote? Asian. Mr. Don't tell me. It, I know it's not O'Neill. It's, uh, ah, Kettner? Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> Those things, therefore, which are in the voice are symbols of the passions of the soul, and when written are symbols of those of the voice. And as there are not the same letters among all men, so neither have all the same voices, yet those passions of the soul, of which these are primarily the signs, are the same among all the things also of which, you know, of which these are the symbols of the are the good. Good, excellent, sir. Um, and that's where you can find it if you look up his De Interpretatione. Okay, so this became a pretty famous and classic definition in Western culture for what is writing. And it's just a little piece. I mean, this is like at the beginning, I think, of his, his work or near the beginning. He really wasn't focused on talking about the nature of writing, but he, he just makes a comment. And this comment about what writing was or writing is became the standard definition or at least the go-to definition in the in the western world for a long long time so i give it to you um it was highly influential and this is if you read have read or read the article by florian colmas he talks about that he says this brief statement became highly influential in western thinking about writing but what does it mean well for aristotle um, and I think there's some truth in this. Writing was a secondary sign system, you could say. Talking is the primary one. Um, maybe the ultimate sign system will be in your head for Aristotle, the concepts that are in your head, and then they're, they're spoken, the air moves out of your mouth in certain ways and creates certain sounds and sound vibrations that a person can hear. And then, the, you know, finally, when writing finally develops, which is a late development for humans, um, people take use symbols to write down those sound vibrations, the speech that's coming out, the air that's coming out of your mouth, and, and representing, ultimately, concepts in your own mind that you can't otherwise really communicate, right? You're not, we're not Vulcans. You can't do a mind meld, you know? <laughs> that's it. You know, I'm not Mr. Spock. Okay, so you can't, you know, my mind to your mind, my thoughts to your thoughts. No, that ain't going to happen. Or at least it probably won't happen. I mean, if you start reading my mind and reading my thoughts, then tell me, because I got to put in a care report for you. Maybe you need some meds or something, <laughs> you know, um, or if I start hearing your thoughts, you know. Um, but no, so you can't communicate. You want to communicate them. Speech communicates, but speech, again, is air and air just disappears, right? The sound goes away, but writing can make it permanent. So it just, it's a, a sign system. It's secondary to what's going on in our heads and we're communicating through speech, um, which I guess for Aristotle, the primary sign system would be um, speech itself, which makes sense because in Greek culture, orality speaking was more important than writing, believe it or not. Your ability to speak was much more highly prized. You know, that's what you did. You gave a speech. You didn't write a book if you wanted to really influence people. And, you know, um, so for Aristotle, you have the mental experience, the concepts in your mind, or the thoughts and emotions, and that's what, let me just go back for a second, the passions, that's what he's referring to when he, that's just a fancy philosophical word for emotions, pathematone, you know, like sympathetic, empathetic, you know, it's, it's feeling, okay, pathos means to feel. So in emotions, the emotions of the soul, okay, the, the voice gives symbols to that, gives expression to the emotions of the soul, or the thoughts, we could say, of the mind. 
your mental experience, and then it goes into the spoken words, which are the symbols of your mental experience, and then you reach the top, which is writing, which is the symbol of the spoken word. So, like, writing is a symbol of a symbol. You know. So, writing is symbolic. And ultimately, it wants to represent what's going on in our heads, and our minds. He says the soul, which is, I mean, I guess you could say it's the kind of corporate or general term for everything that makes us us. You know, we would say mind today. And this is where Ms. Wenrick's point about pictures comes in because, and this is why I drew this, because these, I think you would say, if I asked you, are these pictures or are these writing, how would you know? I mean, if we look at them from the vantage point of pictures, I mean, maybe this first one is kind of obvious. What does it look like? Huh? Person. A person. A person. Why not an arrow? Why not an arrow? You think that's a head? It's a circle. That's a head? Ms. Uh, don't tell me. What's the first letter of your last name? M. M? Yeah. M. McDonald? No. Nope. Not there yet. Sorry. I'll get it. McGowan. Okay. Yeah. That's Ms. McGowan. I feel like that's how we draw stick figures. Okay. How we use them. So if you were going to draw a stick figure of a human being, that's how you do it. But maybe if you were in ancient Samaria, that might be a picture of Shin Sar. I feel like right now they're from the same place. Because everyone's out of here, right? What if an ancient Samarian wrote that? You don't know them. You're, I, I wrote it. Okay, so we can assume that there's common knowledge, right? But, you know, what if, what if it was someone from ancient Samaria where this is a picture of Shin Sar? Not a, okay, not a person. Okay, all right, let's move on to the next one. What do you think the next one is? A house? Why? How do you know that's a roof? You just assume. Okay, good. I think you're right. That you you have to assume. But see, now you're getting kind of like to the point with pictures. You have to make assumptions with pictures. If I wrote the word house here, there wouldn't be, or the symbols that would sound out the word house, you wouldn't make that assumption necessarily. Yeah, Mr. Kettner, not Mr. Kettner, Mr. O'Neill. So that was an arrow. Yeah, could that be an arrow pointing up? How do you know it's a house and not an arrow? The star was up in the sky. Or a shooting star, I should say. And what's the last one? What do you think the last one is? Go ahead. A tree? Good woman, yes. <laughs> I didn't think someone would get that. I'm surprised. Very good. Yeah, it's a tree. At least I intended it to be a tree. I intended it to be a tree. Um, I can't think of whatever what else it might look like. I mean, what else could, it be? You could say it's a telephone pole? Um, but anyways, you know, whatever. So, okay, that's what I think is the difference that I want to make about writing and pictures. That pictures need a lot of interpretation. You have me here to tell you that, yes, I intended this to be the figure of a person. I intended this to be a figure of a house. And I intended this to be a figure of a tree. Okay? But there's still pictures. Even though, Ms. Renrick, you can, maybe you can discern what the pictures are, like you're in the Lascaux Caves from like you know, some caveman from 50,000 years ago draws a, a picture of a bison on the wall. And you're like, oh, I can tell that's a bison. But you don't know why the person wrote it and put it on the wall. It's a picture. It, you, you, you can't interpret it. You don't have any further information. If I wanted to say these were also pictures that were writing, because some languages use pictures for writing, what does it mean? Person, house, tree. Well, it can mean a lot of things. The person, I could be intending it to mean the person is in the house by the tree. 
you know, the person is walking towards the house by the tree or under the tree or, you know, or whatever. Or, as I said, let's say it's, it's totally wrong and it's not a person. It's, it's the shooting star was up in the sky and then fell down to the earth. This is an arrow pointing down. And then it, it hit the earth. Okay. That's kind of like what's going on with the Egyptian hieroglyphics. They're all pictures, and several pictures, and you more read a story from them than you read words from them, letters. So that's the difference between, say, drawing a picture and drawing writing, uh, draw, uh, writing. Because even though writing has its source in pictures, it changes. Pictures start to be used to express concepts and then sounds that come out of people's mouths expressing concepts. So it's so writing is different. You know, the, ob the, the objects of a picture don't tell us very much. They're representations. Whereas writing is a representation of what someone thinks and says. So it's a human contrivance, or a word that we can use is artifact, an artifact, which comes from a Latin expression, arte faccio. Faccio means to make. Faccio means to make. Hacer in Spanish, or facere in Italian. I'm losing another one. Uh -oh. <laughs> faccio means to make, and arte is from the Latin word artist for art, so we get our word for art. And it means by, it's in the ablative case, so it means to make by art or by skill. So to do something skillfully or do something with skill. So writing is a, is a, is a, contr a human contrivance. We've created it. It's an artifact of us, which is a, a thing that seems to have been made or produced by human agency or action. You can tell this was made by a human. If you can look at something, an archaeologist, and you dig something up, and you, this looks like something that was looks like it was human generated, didn't just naturally this little I don't know doll or some female figurine or something that probably didn't just naturally occur in the rock formation. It looks like someone etched the, put etched the eyes in and put a little paint here. And so, so who else would do that? Maybe dolphins. <laughs> Dolphins are pretty smart. And whales are kind of smart too. Oh, and elephants, yeah. But, you know, in my experience, I haven't seen very many, many elephants, you know, with a little carving device. <laughs> Probably it's a human. You have to assume, we usually assume that it's a human, and we call it an artifact. <laughs> Writing is also a technology. It's a technology because it requires tools and equipment. So you need to use a brush or a pen, or you use, you use paper or wood to write on. You have to write with something, so you use ink, or you use um, paint. <laughs> that's, that's what it's called, painting, Dr. Dunn. Get with it. Uh, hold on a second. All right, there we go. So there's your definition of a technology from the Greek word techne, which means an art, a skill, a craft. Okay, so related um, to the Latin word artis, which also means art or skill. So a techne is an art or a skill or a craft, also a form of knowledge. It comes from a Greek word tikto, which means to bring something forth, to beget, you know, and. And it's interesting that if you talk to people who are artists, sometimes they kind of talk about their art or their artistic endeavor in that way. It's almost like a begetting, a birth, a conception in a way, a conception and pregnancy and then birth, giving birth to their art. You know, they use that procreative terminology, which is this kind of ties up with TikTo um, for technology to bring something forth to beget as a mother begets or a father begets a child or produce as a mother produces a child in her womb. So a technology is the way in which knowledge is applied in practice, your skill in applying it in practice. And so these tools and equipment are used to express or convey knowledge. Knowledge, what's going on in the mind, what is in the mind of the person, and what the person expresses of his or her mind in speech. Primarily in speech, I think. But then again, a person could be sitting down and writing a book and not talking at all, and the person's still writing. They can't say a word, might not say a word, but the person's pumping out a book, you know? 
So it doesn't necessarily involve speech, but in the ancient world, it often did. Speaking was a big thing. I mean, that's how you read as well. You know, you would read when you read things, you spoke them. Um, I remember that the famous uh, politician and emperor Julius Caesar of the Roman Empire was one of the little details we know about his personality because someone noticed it because it was so unusual is that he didn't speak when he read things. He just sat there and read and his lips didn't move. Because it was that wasn't common. You were, you would talk out. You would not just read it, but you would speak it. So there was that connection with orality, as we see in Aristotle. <laughs> so writing is the act of creating a pers a persistent representation of human language. Talking is not. Oral speech is not. Once I die, everything I said is gone, and un unless it was recorded. Either well, they didn't have uh, they didn't have uh, recorders back then, you know. Um, they just had writing for up until the last century, or I should say, the 18, late 1800s when they started making audio recording devices. Um, until then, it was just writing. You had someone took down the words that you said, and hopefully took them down accurately. Um, but it, at least that's persistent. If you're in an oral culture. How many oral cultures that passed on all these stories that the person dies, the person who knows all the story dies, and they're just gone? That's why we don't know a lot about so many cultures, especially in like North and South America, Australia, New Zealand. They just didn't develop writing cultures, and so we don't we don't have anything because the people who told the stories are dead. Um, even in writing cultures, people where they had writing, we only have, well, what we can find, what we found, and what they decided to preserve. They didn't write down every word everybody was saying, even the famous people, all the time. You know, and you'll find that in reading the, the Bible with the Gospels. Not everything that Jesus said was written down, surprise, surprise. Imagine how many things this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, said that were just not written down. They wrote down what was important to them. So writing is a persistent representation of human language and a writing system uses a set of symbols and rules to encode aspects. It's a form of encoding spoken language, such as the vocabulary, but also the way that those units of language are organized. So language also can record grammar, how those words are supposed to be used in a sentence or are being used in a sentence. Whoops. So according to our reading from Florian Colmas, writing systems, he says, quote, the single most consequential, it, he calls writing the single most consequential technology ever invented. Because once you have writing, then you have history. Because history means story. Before that, you have people telling stories, but nothing written down, apparently. So they're lost. But once you can start writing stuff down and recording the stories, now you have history, properly speaking. Okay, what are the kinds of writing? Um, this, is, this is a classic definition, again, from a, a famous linguist called Ferdinand Saussure. Uh, I think he was from Switzerland. And he wrote a book uh, way back when, over 100 years ago, called Course in General Linguistics. There's a picture of him. And he identifies two essential kinds of writing system. First is ideographic, and the second is phonetic. What are these? Yes, he's Swiss. He died in 1913. When was the book written again? Well, it came out after his death, obviously. At least published after his death. Um, of course, in general linguistics. So ideographic. Ideographic comes from two words. Idea, a form, a form or an image, which is related to the Greek word eideo, which means to see, to see. And yes, these are spelled, these O's are spelled correctly because in transcribing Greek, the Greek alphabet, which is different from English, into English, um, this is an omega, it's a different letter. There's another, there's a short O called an omicron, O. So it's short, but an O is an omega, and so to indicate that, you put a line over it. There's also a long E, an eta, which has a line over it, just so you know. So it's not there for nothing, okay? There's a purpose to it. So ideo means to see something. So a form or an image that has been written 
or written down, transcribed, scratched, grapho, grapho in Greek, literally is to scratch, to draw, to paint, and then later comes to be associated with writing. And so what are ideographic writing systems? They're basically picture systems. This is where pictures have developed into words and even representations of sound. So a word is represented by a single sign that sometimes might be a picture of the thing, like you draw a fish and that means fish. Um, but sometimes it's just unrelated to the word, the sound of the word at all. I mean, I'm, it, it's just, you know, it's a fish, but you know, the, you can't tell the pronunciation from the picture. You just see the picture. Okay. And each written sign stands for the whole world, oh, world for the whole word. And so the most common example, a lot of people use this is Chinese. Chinese is an ideographic language system. Most of the language systems on the planet, the writing systems, are phonetic, however. They are phonetic. They are based on sounds. They have characters that represent individual sounds or sometimes sounds together like syllables. And it comes from the Greek word phoneo to make a sound, to make a sound, to speak loudly. I thought that was going to be funnier than it was. <laughs> Well, I'm just seeing if you're still awake, Mr. Plange. No, I know you're awake, sir. God bless you, sir. You're with me. All right. You and me, Mr. Plange. Uh, anyway, so phonetic. So sound-based to make a sound, okay? These are types of writing systems that reproduce or try to reproduce as best they can. Some do it better than others. English is one that does not do it as well as people might like. Also Irish. Irish is worse than English in spelling. You know, try to pronounce an Irish word or figure out what the pronunciation is. It's good. Go with God, my friend. <laughs> um, but then you have other languages like, you know, maybe German or Spanish where you know, it's pretty, pretty clear, you know, the, the, the letters uh, and the sounds match up. You can, you, can, you can phonetically pronounce the language pretty correctly, whereas in English you might not know. Um, I mean, just look. I mean, it's a P sound, but we pronounce it like an F. So it's phonetic, not phonetic, you know. Um, but you have to know that the H indicates that. So it, reduce, it reproduces the succession of sounds that make up a word, sometimes by syllable and sometimes alphabetically by letters and vowels, consonants and vowels. Writing systems don't constitute a language in and of itself, but writing systems are a means for encoding language so that it can be read by others across space and time. So it allows me, for example, in the case of hieroglyphics again, Egyptian hieroglyphics. Well, we'll get to it when they died out. I'm trying to remember when they died out. Um, but anyways, um, you know, we can read Egyptian hieroglyphics from say 5,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago. How can we do that? Well, because they wrote it down. And so the writing system, and for the longest time, we didn't know what the hieroglyphics meant. It was only in the 1800s that they found a stone with an inscription, part of it in Greek, and the rest of it in Egyptian hieroglyphics. And thankfully, the Greek was a translation of the hieroglyphics, or vice versa, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, and so the, you know, the Europeans didn't know who found the stone. They did not know how to read Egyptian hieroglyphics. They knew it was a language. They knew it was an alphabet of some sort. Not an alphabet, actually. Ideographic thing. They knew it meant something, but they didn't know. But now they knew, but they did know Greek. They knew Greek, so they could back translate and that's how they had that break, had a breakthrough in the 1800s um, in, in Egyptian studies and in, in hieroglyphic studies. Um, so they were able to do that. So the writing system um, is just the means for encoding it. And we can now read what the Egyptians were writing about um, thousands and thousands of years ago because of this writing system that's been preserved. And it was all over the place. We're just going to read it. The same thing happened with Maya in, in southern Mexico and Guatemala. For the longest time, we knew they had a writing system. We just couldn't translate it. And ultimately, it's only in the last maybe 20 years that they were able to finally decipher the, the Mayan writing system. So what are the types of writing systems that we can have? 
we can have what are called log logographies, logographic writing systems. We can have syll syllabic or syllabaries, and we can have alphabets, alphabets, which I would say most human languages that are written down are alphabets. It seems to be the easiest to work with. Not to take away from any other system, but this seems to be the one that's the most popular. So logography, let's start with that. That's basically, again, a picture system. You could also call it ideographic or pictographic is sometimes how linguists will refer to it. But I guess nowadays they'll call it logographic because logos means word literally in Greek. But actually the word logos in Greek can mean a whole bunch of things. It can be used to refer to wisdom, human reason, thought. You know, it has a whole boatload of meanings, but its essential meaning is kind of this word. And gramma in Latin, or in Latin, gramma in Greek means a drawing or a picture. So a drawing of a word. Okay, logograms are written characters or symbols meant to represent a complete word or concept. Essentially and historically, log logography is the actual drawing of an object or concept. Okay, so it's rooted in that, that basic human activity of drawing pictures. Okay, and it later becomes more stylized. You know, people will eventually, like that, I gave you the example of a picture of a fish. And so I draw a picture of a fish and it looks like a fish, so you know the word is fish. But as time goes by, you know, the fish might become a little bit, the picture might become a little bit distorted and changed and it looks like something else, but you still know that it means fish. It might become more stylized. That happens a lot. <laughs> I think I have a picture to show you that. So examples, a modern example of a logographic language is Chinese, okay? So, oh, excuse me, it's <laughs> a modern example. I started out with an old example. Sorry about that. An old example of an ideographic or a pictographic or a logographic language is cuneiform, is uh, what's called cuneiform, wedge-shaped letters um, that were pressed into clay tablets, okay? Um, by uh, the Sumerians, and I'll talk about that, I'll talk about the Sumerians later, but I just want to give you an example. So this is a text um, from a, a, an emperor called Cyrus, it's also mentioned in the Bible, and uh, this is a text of, of uh, uh, that was impressed on a cylinder, a clay cylinder, they would roll the, I guess they would, you know, roll it out or something, you'd have to roll the text or do something, but, you know, as you wanted to read it, you would roll it rather than like a book, but they would print the text all on the surface and so they you know rolled out the text onto a sheet of paper so you can see it here flat basically and you can see it's all a bunch of wedges and these are all really pictures ultimately that re represent words so if you you understand the picture then you know what the words are and a modern example as i said a moment ago but there it is is chinese Chinese, where each of these symbols is really a, ultimately a picture of something. Sometimes you can kind of see the connection between the word and the thing. Most times, I think, as you can tell, you can't. Okay, it's very stylized. And uh, actually, the top text here is Chinese proper. This is, this is Chinese characters. This is actually not. This is Vietnamese, which is a totally different language from Chinese. Um, but China, like I mentioned with Latin, Latin Romans had their empire and they, they passed around their language, they propagated the language. China, Chinese writing was pro maybe not the language Chinese, but certainly the writing systems propagated throughout Southeastern Asia and Eastern Asia through the uh, various Chinese empires that there were, going all the way down to Vietnam, Korea, Japan. Okay, so it used to be that Vietnamese, Vietnamese is now written with an alphabet, but they used to, up until maybe like the 1800s, maybe even the 1900s, um, were still writing um, Vietnamese with classical Chinese characters. So this is actually Chinese Chinese, and then here's Vietnamese translating what the Chinese says. A Chinese person, a person from China who has, you know, learned Mandarin Chinese with their standard that they're teaching nowadays, this would all be gibberish. 
it's all be gibberish. It would make no sense to the person. They would recognize that their character's in Chinese. Maybe you'd recognize what the character refers to the word, but it would be like gibberish. It'd be all jumbled up, you know, because it doesn't represent Chinese words anymore. It represents Vietnamese concepts. So it's pictures. So that's one of the benefits and the beauties of a picture based writing system is that you can have two completely different languages using the same pictures. I mean, the pronunciation will definitely be different. The grammar will sometimes will definitely be different. Um, but you know, you'll, you'll be, you'll be able to understand like a person who um, has learned Chinese characters, even if you can read the Chinese, even if you know, your, your ultimate, your beginning language is Vietnamese, you know, you'll, you'll understand some of the symbols and what they mean, even if you can't speak the words. Okay, um, so that's one of the good things about it. One of the bad things is that you have to learn thousands and thousands and thousands of different pictographs, and, and, and they take a long time to write them down. They're, it's not as easy as it's like an alphabet or something. The next kind is a syllabary. A syllabary, which is based on, as the name says, syllables. So what is a syllable? A syllable is the name for a specific unit of one or more meaningful sounds. One or more meaningful sounds. Oftentimes two sounds. So like, you know, sil. Actually it should be sil. I should say, I should say syllable. Three syllables. There are three meaningful sound units in this one word. Syllable. Okay? In some languages, the, the syllable might be just one meaningful sound unit. You know, it might be just one thing. It might be a, a vowel or something. Uh, and that's the same thing in English, you know? Um, you know, because we have words like, uh, well, form. All right? There's one syllable, you know? Um, uh, but I wanted to get it with the, well, it doesn't matter. You get my point, I think. Anyways, and a syllabary, a syllabary is based on, on uh, using characters or symbols to represent the various syllables of the language. So it's not, now we're moving away from pictures. You're not drawing pictures of things and giving them words or something um, attached to them or concepts attached to the picture, there now you're moving away from pictures. You're drawing, in a way, still drawing pictures in a way, but you're drawing um, characters or symbols that are meant to uh, represent sound, individual sounds themselves. So you're taking a syllable is something that's taken together, so in a word. So uh, you see the Greek there, sun lambano. To take together, soon means with or together, and lambano to take something together. So a syllable, things, the sounds that are taken together that make up the word. In some cases, it's one sound, like form. In other cases, it's three, like syllable, but they're taken together to form the word. You can't have each one individually because it won't make sense. If I, if I pronounce that bull, you know, <laughs> what? what you, well, the S, Y, L, L, A are all silent. <laughs> They're silent. It's pronounced bull, actually. <laughs> no, 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 it wouldn't make any sense. You have to take them all together. So written symbols representing syllables, usually combining a vowel. And what is a vowel, if you're curious? Interestingly, and I was curious, I just looked it up as I was interested. What, what is a vowel, you know? It's a sound produced without closure of the larynx or the vocal tract. So if, you're, if your larynx does not close in the making of the sound, that's considered a vowel. But if, you're, but if your larynx or your vocal tract makes, uh, is, is constricted or closed in making the sound, then that's a consonant, a consonant. So you think about ah, the A sound, ah, A, E, E, yeah, I, mean, I can feel like my, my, my vocal passage is clear, but if I try to say ke, ke, or mm, mm, I can't do it without at least partially my larynx closing up a little bit. So that's the difference between a vowel and a, uh, a consonant, except for H apparently. H is, H is different. H, I guess the larynx is open somewhere. <laughs> now, what kind of languages use syllabaries? Well, I mentioned one of them already. We have Japanese. Okay, Japanese is a very complicated language to learn. 
um, and, and its writing system. The language itself is a beautiful language. I don't know if it's that hard to learn, maybe for a Westerner, but um, it's nothing like Chinese. It's a completely different language family. It's its own language family, the Japonic family. Um, it doesn't seem to be related to any other language on the planet. Um, but they, they took over, um, they were influenced by China. So, you know, if you're Japanese, you have to learn not just Chinese, the Chinese characters, thousands of them, but they don't exactly fit exactly with the, the Japanese language because the grammar is different. Uh, and sometimes you you need to spell out Japanese words so that out of necessity, born out of necessity, they had to create their own symbol system to represent Japanese stuff. So they chose a syllabic system. So here it is. You have to learn Jap not just Chinese characters, but all these other things. The syllabary, um, a basic syllabary of vowels, but then their combinations of various consonants, ka, ki, ku, ke, ko, okay, na, ni, nu, ne, no. And so each of these little symbols represents the syllable that you want to write. You might notice, you might notice, have noticed that there are two actually, because the Japanese had to complicate <laughs> So I don't know why they did this, just leave it alone, no. Um, they, the second row of these um, syllable uh, representations are for like uh, the, when we would use italics in English, like you want to emphasize a word or spelling out a person's name or spelling out scientific names and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's meant to give more emphasis uh, to to the, the letter. So they so now you have to learn a whole bunch of different symbols for the syllables to, if you want to spell out like my name in or your name in Japanese. That's how they would they would use it. They wouldn't use Chinese characters. They would revert to this and they would use this second level. You know, however, so ma. Let's see, we got a ma, so they would use this one down here for ma. And what would we say chu? Is there a ma t? Is there a T? Yeah, there's a T. There's chi, ma, T. And then U. Is there a U? Yeah, there's a U. So they, so I can pretty much figure out how the, the... And I checked it on Google Translate, how they would spell my name using the second row. So it's like a... So Japanese. Another language that uses um, a syllabary is Cherokee. So this is our homegrown from Native Americans, the Cherokee. Um, this man, Sequoia. Yeah, I got you. Intelligent man, who Cherokee Indian, who developed a way to express the sounds that were made by his own language, and he chose a syllabary. So, you, and some of these sounds are, are quite interesting. You know, na. Some of these syllabs, pla, bla. Um, I think they also have gutturals. Are there any gutturals? I know you got. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's very, you know, the Native American languages are very intricate and very interesting in their sounds. Um, but, you know, it's a very, also, it's, it's kind of a complicated, you can see it's, the writing system is, it's nice, you know, but it's, I would think it's hard to write. <laughs> yeah, because the symbols are very, some of them are very uh, intricate, I should say. But nice. Okay. Um, so Cherokee opted. They opted for a syllabary as well, and so that would be a modern example. Okay. My last comment, and then we can go. According to J. T. Hooker, and I, did I put this on the PowerPoint. I hope I did. Yes, J. T. Hooker in his book, his introduction. Well, actually, it's not his book. Um, J. T. Hooker, he wrote an introduction to this book called Reading the Past, Ancient Writing from Cuneiform, which is really our first form of human writing that we know of, to the alphabet, which came later. When scribes first used a logogram, or a picture, one might say, to represent not a word, but a syllable of their own language, they made the most important advance in the history of writing. Because that's the, that's the boundary, that's the breaking point. When human beings stopped just using pictures, but when these pictures started to represent actual speech sounds, and not just the idea of a fish, but actually the sound of and it and sh, and then these pictures started to represent that. Now you have starting, you start to have the movement to a true alphabet, 
This, and it was a, it was a, an essential development and a, really in advance um, because it was it was much easier it was, it was much easier to write and not taking away from like Chinese or other but it was much people found it much easier to deal with and much universalizing in, in the ability to write all different sorts of languages okay whereas as you see with Chinese and Japanese you have to kind of cram the Chinese in, into it same thing with Vietnamese um, and it doesn't always worker um, but the alphabet worked pretty well we'll get on to the alphabet in the next class which I will teach on on Tuesday so God bless you all have a good weekend